Hi, it's Robin. Today we're going to be looking at Sid Meier's Pirates, the original Commodore 64 version that Sid himself coded. Now, there's already lots of videos looking at the gameplay of Pirates, so we won't spend much time on that, but instead we'll look at some interesting quirks and bugs in the game, and then look at some of Pirates' original code. That's possible because, bizarrely, a large portion of this game is coded in BASIC. Now, Sid Meier is one of the most famous and successful computer game designers of all time. He's worked on many games before and after Pirates, such as few in my collection, F-15 Strike Eagle, Silent Service, The Submarine Simulator, Gunship, The Helicopter Simulator, after Pirates, Red Storm Rising, The Nuclear Attack Submarine Simulator. There were also remakes of Pirates, such as Pirates Gold in 1993, that came out on the Amiga CD32, DOS, Sega Genesis. And again, Pirates was remade in 2004 for Windows, Xbox, Wii, and a bunch of other platforms. Unfortunately, not for C64. And lots of other games like Railroad Tycoon, Alpha Centauri, and probably most famously, the Civilization series. He wasn't actually the lead designer on Civilization 3, but it's the only one of these newfangled games that I own. And this multiplayer expansion still has his name on it, though. And Pirates is the first game that he put his name on. Apparently it wasn't his idea. He's not like an egomaniac. Robin Williams, the actor-comedian, apparently was at a meeting with the Microprose guys and suggested that they start putting his name on the box and promote him, kind of like a rock star. And it seems to have worked. Now, Pirates is one of the first open-world games I had ever played, even if we didn't use that term, open-world, back then. Being able to freely explore a huge world, trade cargo, build a fleet of ships, join different factions, just experience life in another world, that was amazing for me at the time. And C64 Pirates is largely considered one of the greatest C64 games there is. On Lemon 64, it's voted the number two C64 game of all time. Not everybody's in complete agreement, of course. Here in Commodore Force Magazine, number 7, from July 1993, they reviewed Pirates and gave it a terrible 40%. I'd like to think, though, that was because they were reviewing the cassette version. You could see from this screenshot, the combat takes place in just this white background, and as we'll see in the game, the disc version loads high-res bitmaps behind here and... They never really should have released a cassette version anyway. Money grab, I guess. Also, while researching this episode, I found the Sid Meier's Pirates wiki on fandom.com. Pirates 1987 was the original Sid Meier's Pirates game. It used the graphics of an Atari game. Not much is known about how the game played out, but there are pictures of it. If anyone has the game, please add pictures. Hyperdan 2000. <laughs> so, it used the graphics of an Atari game. And just to briefly look at the game, here's the main menu. Do you wish to start a new career? Okay. Do you want to select a special historical period? So you can actually play the game at several different eras. But no, we won't do that. And I'll just do a lot of jump cutting today. Just to get to the part of the game that I want to show, are you going to be English, French, Dutch, or Spanish? And it does matter quite a bit because it affects how different towns and governors will treat you. So I'll just be English. And what is my family name? I come from a long line of Robin. Mr. Robin and we'll just play Apprentice. And you can choose your special skill and I think I'll just take Fencing. Young and poor, you seek your fortune in the new world. To purchase passage, you indenture yourself, binding you to work on a sugar plantation for five years as payment. 
But on the plantation, your debts only grow. Oh, I'm sad. You decide to escape this life of debt slavery. You ask some local seamen about joining the Brethren of the Coast. Aye, matey, they reply. But do you know when the silver train arrives at Maracaibo in 1660, Mr. Robin? <laughs> Did I even say that right? Mara, Maracaibo? And this is part of the not-so-subtle copy protection that the game Pirates has. If you were using a pirated copy of Pirates, then you may have run into this. It's a fantastic manual. What is it? 88 pages of good information. Here on page 40, it tells us that the Silver Train in 6060 arrives in Maracaibo in late April. So here we choose April. And to be more precise, late in the month. The seamen are really buccaneers in need of knowledge. They invite you to join their party. But the voyage is unprofitable. The men decide new leadership is required. They nominate you to duel the captain for command of the ship. And here we are. So Pirates actually has this kind of combat. Reminds me a little bit of Karataka with swords, because of how slow it goes. There, I'm on the right, and I already got one shot in on the enemy captain. There we go. Oh! <laughs> Especially when you have the skill at fencing, that's quite easy to win. Victorious, you and your friends put the malcontents ashore. Now it's time to set course for adventure, fame, and fortune along the fabled Spanish Main. Okay, and now we insert disc side two. The sailing master takes you aside here in Port Royal. You'll probably be wanting to see the English governor and visit a tavern too. The men will be anxious for plunder and adventure, so we needn't be sightseeing for too long. The closest Spanish city is Santiago, and so on. I missed the rest of that. Pretty neat how it gives these descriptions of all the different ports and where you can go visiting the governor. My dear Mr. Robin, we are at war with the Spanish and we are at war with the Dutch. I charge you to seek out and destroy our enemies, ships, and towns. And those things will change as the game progresses. And every time you play the game, it'll be a bit different. Okay, so we can leave town. There you go, it's the full world scrolling around. And there's these random encounters. Sail ho, the lookout reports a sail on the horizon. We're in English waters, the master reminds. Shall we investigate? It looks like a merchantman captain. Shall we investigate? She's flying English colors, and we're English, so we better not fight them. We'll hail for news instead. And you get this list of news that's been happening in the world. That can be useful information. And the winds have a huge effect on your ship speed and ability to navigate, uh, although it's a lot easier. We've got it on the easiest level right now. On the more difficult levels, it becomes uh, very difficult to navigate uh, if you don't go with the wind. And you can get out of the boat and uh, land whenever you want. <laughs> and there's your landing party. search for treasure, or attack a town from on land, or on land. Okay, we'll investigate. Now we're in Spanish waters. Okay, we're going to close for battle. So the combat's quite strategic. It's kind of arcade. But down at the bottom it says you're reloading. And depending on the winds, you can af can affect your speed quite a bit. Joystick up to raise sail. Full sails. Now my speed is 10. I should be able to catch up with this other ship quite easily. Uh oh As you approach the enemy ship, a white banner shoots. They've struck their colors, Captain. The crew cheers. Oh, they're just going to surrender.
Yeah, and then you can choose to keep the ship or plunder and sink. Okay, and we'll take everything here. And you do have limited capacity. There. <laughs> so that's a bug in the game that you can sometimes, if you're holding down fire right as the battle begins, you can often shoot straight off your bow and uh, get the first shot in. <laughs> and then once you've damaged them enough or shot enough of their men, you can just basically ram the ship and then fight their captain. This fight kind of serves as a proxy for what the rest of your men are doing. Okay, now I'm restarting the game, and this time I'm going to deliberately answer the copy protection question wrong, so you can see what the game does. By the way, if you've got an original copy of the game that is something other than version 132x01, like it said down the bottom left corner there, I'd love to hear about that. So I've jumped ahead, and it's asking when the silver train arrives at Rio de Hacha, early May. So I will just choose January, early in the month. Okay, so I've deliberately chosen the wrong date. The smugglers sneer at your ignorance, but need a strong back to haul cargoes ashore. Eager to escape debt slavery, you join, but alas, your comrades have more surprises in store for you. So this is how the game is different, and they nominate you to duel. Okay, so I, I did choose skillet fencing again. You see what happens this time. Oh, I got one hit in, two. Oh, the captain's basically invincible. Sometimes I've gotten as many as 15 hits on the captain, and then he finally gets one on me, and I'm done. Defeated, you and a few supporters are put in a small, leaky boat. Taunts, jeers, and laughter ring out across the water as you sail away, your face flushed with shame. Okay, so <laughs> this is the hint. You have gotten off to a rather unpromising start in your career. Perhaps you should start over paying heed to your silver train and treasure fleet notes this time. Will you start over or will you continue an unpromising career? So we will do that. So interestingly, the game does let you continue, even if you failed the copy protection check. But it still has some more surprises in store. Okay. okay, so the governors seem more unfriendly. They don't actually give you any other information, like he doesn't tell you to go destroy the enemies. We'll continue voyage. Going really fast there. This is weird. Normally I get a whole bunch of random encounters here. It seems instead it's just giving me endless clouds and no random encounters at all. Okay, there's a town. I'm going in. August, September. And I'm just going to sail into the harbor. Oh, they're open fire. Oh, one of my ships is sunk. With your last ship gone, you're washed ashore on an uncharted island. The local Indians feed you and help you regain your strength. Many months pass. Each month's 
seems an eternity. Advancing age and old battle wounds combine to sap your strength. Perhaps you can complete one more voyage. <laughs> one day, they, oh, they take you back as captain. Okay. So there I am. What happened? The men be grown restless, Captain. If you don't find us plunder soon, me thinks they'll mutiny. <laughs> well, I'm trying. Oh, again. Oh, there's something. Here, we're going to investigate. And we'll close for battle. Finally. Okay, now I've got four guns. Oh, now I'm down to one gun. Turn around. Okay, another fight. <laughs> two men. And he's got 216. Oh, I got shot in. Oh. Basically, the game becomes pretty much impossible and terrible if you answer those questions wrong. Oh, I'm in jail. Okay, now next, I'm going to take this 64 away. And here's another identical seeming C64, but this one I know has a broken SID. So my friend the fat man who some time ago found that interesting bug in Turbo Assembler where decimal numbers got converted incorrectly, he found a neat screen in Pirates that I have never heard of. I've never seen anybody comment on this before. So I'm going to show it to you. This may be the first time anybody's seen this. Again, thanks to the fat man for this. So I'm just going to start a new game with this C64 that I know has a broken SID chip, the sound interface device. And I'll just go through the regular character creation. And here it is. The random number generator in this computer, SID chip oscillator 3, is not functioning correctly. Program will not work unless this is repaired. The SID chip, because of the noise voice, which sounds like white noise, that's created by a pseudo-random number generator, a 23-bit linear feedback shift register in the SID. And so this program is actually aware, <laughs> it actually does some sort of diagnostic to see if that random number generator is functioning correctly. And it's not program will not work unless this is repaired. It actually lets you continue the game and it's asking me when the silver train arrives. And I think that's early March. Yeah, and that's early March. And that's because with the broken random number generator, it always asks me that same question every time. So, uh, you know, March. So I'm going to answer correctly here, March, early in the month. And again, you get the warning that the random number generator in this computer is not functioning correctly. Then the game continues as if you did answer correctly. But when you go to fight, one, oh, there, it sort of treats you like you answered wrong because I got defeated with just one hit. But then it tells you that you are victorious. So the game really does get very confused. Okay, if we leave the town. Okay, so you get these random encounters. And I'll just continue on. And then you get another random encounter. Continue. 
and another random encounter. So this is what happens if your SID is broken. Even if you correct, even if you correctly answer the manual question, you will just get bombarded with this. So there must be an interesting story here about how SIDs, SID, they were testing it on a broken Commodore 64 and found out this was the cause, and that's why he bothered to write that diagnostic and warning message. Okay, so I'll finally investigate. It would just do that. Like every few seconds, you get another random encounter. And then let's see how it goes if you try to fight. Okay, so it says I have eight guns. I'll see if I can win the fight this time. Whoa! Look at my look at my count. <laughs> my my men counted down all the way down to the one. <laughs> so. Without the random number generator working, this game acts bizarrely. Presumably it just keeps returning the same random number over and over again. And that is the same random number that frequently causes random encounters and during combat causes you to lose a man. Okay, I walked into town. We're going to sneak into town. Okay, if we do here, trade with a merchant. I just want to show you this. So you see how right now, so you see up here it says I have 10 gold. I want to show another bug that got a lot of people when they played this game, or got some. I'm going to freeze. Here, and I've actually got the action replay. My beloved Super Snapshot actually cannot freeze this game without crashing. I don't know why. So that's something I want to investigate sometime. So I'm using the action replay and going into the monitor. Okay, and I'm going to look here at memory location 9427. And this is a 16 bit value representing how many groups of 10 gold pieces I have. So here's the high byte zero. The low byte is 1, and you multiply that by 10 to get the number of gold pieces. So this is 1 hex, or 1 decimal, which represents 10 gold pieces. So I'm going to change that to DCFF, and this is a very large number that almost overflows the 16-bit value of gold. Okay, now I will exit out and resume, and now I will again trade with the merchant. And now if you look at the gold up at the top left, once it's done loading the merchant here, there. <laughs> so now my gold is 655000 pieces. And I have known some people, I never did it myself, but I had friends who played this game so much that they would get their gold up to this kind of high number and unknowingly, then they would sell, for example, their food. And you see how it's counting up here. The maximum amount of gold we can hold is 655350, because that's the maximum value that the 16-bit variable can hold. So if I sell one more, watch that gold up in the top left. <laughs> it wrapped around to zero. Okay, and now I've sold some more food. But if I try to go back, I have lost all that gold. I can't go less than zero. It has error checking for going below zero. But if you try to go above FFFF hex, 65535 decimal, it will wrap around a zero and you will lose all your gold. That might be represent weeks of playing. Of course, hopefully you don't save the game right after. If you notice that 
then you've only lost your gameplay up to the last uh, <laughs> the last uh, time you saved. So I just wanted to show that bug. Uh, it just doesn't have boundary checking, upper limit boundary checking, and that can be terrible when you've basically lost everything you've played for. Okay, now I mentioned that this game is written in BASIC, so people found this out completely by accident. I don't know if this will work for sure, but a lot of the time if you just pop the disc out and then make the game load, like here, I'll try and leave town and re-enter town. Oh, it survived that. But you see that it's got a garbage image there. So here, I'll try and sneak into town. Again, with the disc out. I can't always make it crash the first try. Yeah, let's try visiting the governor now. So far, all I'm doing is garbling the portraits. There we go. <laughs> okay. So you see, the game has now crashed to basic with a string too long error in 8620. And now, this isn't ideal, but I'm, I'll do a list here and just watch what happens. And there's a bunch of basic code, but it does get garbled. There we go. Yeah, it starts right itself, and it'll probably really get messed up here. The silver train is in town, line 17736. <laughs> but anyway, that is the code for the game. Okay, so I'm going to once again start the game, and this time I'm going to go into my super snapshot. This is an easy flash. Three, by the way, it can behave like several different freezer cartridges. And it's important to disable your freezer cartridge when you are dealing with pirates. It sees that you have a cartridge enabled and prevents you from using it. Okay, once again, we'll try loading it with the super snapshot. And then once you get to the menu, press the reset button. And this time, just press delete to exit normally. Type the at symbol and then the pound symbol and return. And that will enable basic plus, which is an extra set of basic utilities built into the super snapshot. And then just type the command old, which is an extra command it's added, the opposite of new. Okay, and if that worked, then now when we type list, there is the full listing of pirates. Now, actually, this is the basic program that is on side one of the disk. And it's about 52 blocks or 13K in length. And on side two of the disk is a file called main, which is the main game. And it's an incredible... 126 blocks over 31k plus variables and that can be retrieved exactly the same way except that you play through enough of the game to have gotten to side two and once you're at a menu prompt or like in the town for example just reset and then use that old command and th these basic files can be saved out to disk and examined at your leisure so the rest of what we'll do today is just have a look at just some highlights of this basic code. There's so much to it. Obviously, we're not going to go through it all. I mean, I take 90 minutes just to go through one of my own goofy games that's like 1% as complicated as uh, Pirates is. So obviously, we're not going to go in great depth. I'm just going to show you some interesting things here. First off, right at line zero is this remark. So what's really cool about basic code, yeah, it's a total surprise that Pirates, uh, second most popular C64 game of all time, according to some voters, uh, a best-selling game, and a later game, 1987, to think that that game would be largely written in basic. Not completely. It definitely has machine code for 
the pirate ship, like the, the map scrolling and some other important routines to speed it up. But much of the game is code and basic. But what's also cool is that this is like original source code, essentially, shipped with the game right on the original disc. Normally, you just get like the machine language, which doesn't have any comments in it. You know, it's just the assembled or sometimes compiled code in other cases. But since basic's an interpreted language, this is the code that Sid himself wrote back in 1986, 1987. So what's interesting here is right in line zero is a remark, pirates of the Spanish main with exclamation marks. So did Sid originally call this game Pirates of the Spanish Main, and then that just got shortened to Pirates. That's really neat. And you know what? Pirates of the Spanish Main sounded familiar. Well, back around 2004, there was a collectible card game called Pirates. Pirates of the Crimson Coast, Davy Jones Curse. These are expansion packs. They hear the original version of the game before those expansions was called Pirates of the Spanish Main. How about that? And to me, it's a really cool game. Like, it's got these cards with ships on them to punch out. And, uh, anyway, it's cool. It reminds me a little bit of Car Wars, actually. But, of course, on pirate ships. I assume they didn't know about the original name of Pirates, but that'd be hilarious if they did. And, coincidentally, that was released in 2004, the same year that the last Pirates remake came out. Coincidence? I don't know. And here on line 50, we see that there's quite a few different variables defined here. This KP was earlier defined as 256 bytes. Like perhaps that P is for page, a 256 byte page. And 148, so 148 times 256 is 37888. 37888, if I just pop into the monitor here, that is 9,400. And earlier when I hacked the amount of gold, that was right there in the same 9,400 space. So this PRS, I think may stand for either player status or maybe just pointers. But that was part of how I found where that gold was stored. So you can see quite a few pointers are defined here. Uh, data from lines 150 it shows the different scenarios in the game and that's when the game asks you do you want to play like a different time period or special time period silver train ambush the treasure fleet but here look at this one line 153 this one is remarked out commented out the pirates of tortuga Pierre Legrand, 1635. So it looks like this was planned as an extra game mode, but then got commented out for whatever reason. Maybe they ran out of memory. Maybe they never got around to designing it, or there were some bugs or whatever. But it's really cool. Again, because this is in basic, we can get a hint of what was left out of the game, or how the game changed or evolved as it was being worked on. And here's another one, line 165 it would return a string scenario not available. So perhaps they planned on giving a larger list and then for whatever reason telling the player, hey, that scenario is not available. Perhaps they are planning on adding expansion packs in the future. Pretty neat stuff. Okay, and Sid also left other comments just for himself. Different sections of the code do have a header. It's not like elaborate comments. All these comments take up RAM which is very limited on this. So the fact that he left any comments is kind of interesting. So this whole section presumably is about the character in the game. I don't know if that's yourself or whoever you're talking to. If I look at 1100, there's the section called Stories. And I believe this is part of that initial copy protection for asking about the silver train and so on. This section of Stories you can see here, this is part of where you choose what you're going to do. It reads from some data statements, takes the absolute value, and then down here checks and then decides what file to load, F string, whether it's you're going to the tavern, the governor, and so on. 
And ways down here are those actual data statements. And I haven't fully decoded these. This is like what area of the town you're going to go into. And I believe somewhere hidden in here is the silver train and so on the copy protection. But again, I didn't get to the bottom of that. At line 2040 is a trick that I don't remember knowing as a kid, but I saw it in that 10 line basic adventure game that I looked at uh, quite a while ago. The fella had written a text adventure in just 10 lines of basic, and I poured it to the VIC-20. And this is one of the neat tricks is that you provide a big string where every item in the string, each substring is the same length. So apprentice, journeyman, adventurer, and swashbuckler, <laughs> abbreviated here, are each 10 characters. And then you choose one of those four strings. So this is that difficulty level that we looked at. You can choose one of the four strings. And this is a very tidy way of selecting from multiple choices. At line 2900, again a remark, find the city A, C string at cursor. So presumably this routine was complicated enough that Sid left notes for himself here. At lines 3150, we find a few more remarked comments that say, I've taken the liberty, I've taken liberty of checking the map and making some notes. That's what your assistant, I can't, what's his name? The, that guy that helps you on your ship. I think he was supposed to say this before he gives all the directions about where all the different towns are. And they decide to comment that out. And here's an interesting routine where it finds the nearest port for each nationality and what direction they're in. And here it builds up the strings. So this would be like the closest English city or closest Spanish city is... And then gives the name of the city, which lies how many days sailing to the east, north, south, and so on. Okay, here at line 5995, this is that routine that the fat man found about the random numbers. Here's the actual code. So we're peaking location 54299, which is the output of oscillator 3 in the SID chip. So we're peaking at, and then a hundred times, we're going to compare that first peak result with the same location again and again. And we're going to look a hundred times for a difference. If we do not find a difference, that is presumably because the chip is broken and just keeps outputting the same number, then we go to 6,000, where it builds that message about the random number generator in this computer is not functioning. So there it is, that's how it works. Again, I'm sure there's an interesting story behind that. Here at line 14,245, it's the credit screen, and this is where it gives that version number of 132x01. Kind of interesting they use an X instead of like a dot. So if you know of an original copy of this game with a different version number here, that'd be really interesting to see. I don't know if this version 132X01 is the only one that got released publicly or if there were earlier or later versions available. I know that the excellent nostalgia crack of this game updated this to 02, 132X02, because they fixed some bugs and made some other improvements. And Rightfully so, but don't tell me about that one. I just want to know about original ones from Microprose. Okay, and for the second side, I've just hooked up my micro IEC and I had already saved it. Here's basic side two, 127 blocks. So I'll just load that. But again, it can be got the same way just by using that old feature on the Super Snapshot. Actually, lots of cartridges have that feature, I think, or other basic extensions. There's even softer ones. Uh, I think if you look around, you can even find a short type in old program. That's just a series of pokes. And just a few more things from the second file. So you see here the remark, now the game is called Pirates. 
Sid updated the second side, but not the first. <laughs> Line 20 is interesting. So the program sends an initialized command to the disk drive, which doesn't actually erase the disk, it just initializes the 1541 as if you booted it. And then it sends a scratch command to scratch, that is delete, file main, and then it closes. So basically the basic file is deleted, and after deleting the file, it saves the program and then ends. So what this is doing is rather than a save and replace, which is a known buggy command to erase a file in place on 1541, this program is deleting the file and saving again. Probably, Sid, every time he would make changes to this huge basic program, then he would just type run 20, and it would automatically delete his old file and save the new one. So this is further evidence that he actually wrote this game on a real C64 with just a 1541 disk drive. Uh, if if he ever did he ever lose his work this way? <laughs> oh, that'd be that'd be horrible. <laughs> but uh, I thought that was a really neat little detail. Pretty much proof that Sid really did code all this on a real C64 in BASIC. Uh, it was actually the Lodestar guys that used that same technique of adding a particular line that scratches the old file and saves it again. And they would just be in the habit of running that each time they made a new revision. Line 1099. And here's that same trick used with a string, but even more usefully, I think, where all 12 months, January, February, March, April, are all abbreviated in one big string, and this routine picks one month out. And then here's a routine where your personal status is displayed, and here you can actually see exactly where a lot of these, like how much gold the player has, uh, whether you're married or not, whether you have the letter of marquee from various uh, governors, where that's all calculated here, and you can find out the memory location that PRS is that 9400 hex, and so some of these are even flags where they're stored bitwise. So anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, and that second file is just so enormous, but it actually, I think they're under, Sid was under such tight constraints to have this huge basic file, plus all the graphics, the combat, uh, the machine code aspects, and so on. I'm just going to let it run there. There's a lot less remarks, because I think he had to start deleting them from this second file. But there is still a lot of text from the game that you can see in there. And I encourage you to take a look at this for yourself. And if you find any really neat discoveries, then share them in the comments. There's a lot of interest. Maybe I'll make a second video about pirates, but just this, I know this one's gone ridiculously long already. So, <laughs> sorry. And finally, I do want to give a big shout out to Nostalgia, who did an amazing crack of pirates back around 2012. They reduced the game down to a single 1541 side. Plus, they added REU support that acts as a large disk cache. You can load the whole game to your REU, then it plays super fast after that. And they also went through and made some small improvements to the game, fixing a few bugs and so on. If you're looking for a copy of this game to play in your emulator or whatever, then definitely look for the version by Nostalgia. And in general, if you're looking for any game, there's two groups, Nostalgia and Remember that consistently provide the best versions of these games where they actually improve upon the original. All right, that was a long one. I don't know how long that'll add it down to, but boy, I've been recording for an hour and 45 minutes. Whew, thanks very much to my patrons for their support. If you're interested in supporting the channel, then check out my Patreon link below. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.